very proud of this opportunity to work with other departments in the university to promote the mission of diversity on the campus. And some of you might ask, why is diversity so important at this juncture in time? One of the reasons is that we are in a world with incredible change. That change is a consequence of technology that is evolving. Uh, as we saw in last year's Diversity uh, Week keynote address, it is a consequence of demographic change, and it is a consequence also of uh, uh, technology. So we are in a world then where the changes need to be interpreted and need to be learned. Diversity Week sees its mission as providing the tools that are necessary. Some of these tools are, are attitudes. Some of them have to do with behaviors. Some of them have to do with knowledge. And so we want to assist in providing the competencies that are necessary to help all of us negotiate the 21st century. I just want to comment briefly because I had the good fortune of uh, being able to hear our distinguished speaker tonight. And it occurred to me that she is the perfect person to express this message of multiculturalism in the health field uh, this evening. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, here are a number of the things that she mentioned. She mentioned the importance of moving outside one's own comfort zone. And if there's any lesson in diversity that is important, it is that, being able to operate outside your comfort zone. For those of you who are students who will be going into the workplace, this will be an essential tool for you. For those of us in the classroom uh, who are teaching as well as learning, it is, it is crucial to be able to, to move outside of one's own comfort zone. She talked about interdependence, the importance of recognizing that we're all connected together, and that because of that, we, we all are in the same boat, and ultimately, if we are to be successful in negotiating uh, a voyage for that boat, we've got to realize that. She talked about finding common humanity in the other person. She talked about global perspectives. And the idea of being global in one's uh, uh, way of looking at the world means that we're able to connect the global to the regional, to the national, to the local. So these are among the lessons that are important uh, for this week. I'd like to remind you that three days of Diversity Week remain. This is the 16th annual Diversity Week. Uh, events go on from morning to evening. There are 60 events, over 60 events, that take place in five days. I'd like to finally mention that Thanks to the students, the faculty, and staff of the University of Rhode Island, Diversity Week has now become the largest event, diversity education event, in New England 
higher education. And I think you ought to give that a round of applause. At this time, I would like to present Professor Shala Yechter, who will be introducing our speaker of the evening. Good evening. Um, as Melvin said, I'm Shala Yekta. I'm with the College of Nursing, and I'm one of the co-coordinators of the Honors Colloquium. Uh, it is an honor for me tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Joya Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee is the Medical Director of Partners in Health, an international charity organization that probably most of you here have already heard about. Partners in Health has clinical programs in some of the most distressed communities on the planet. Uh, these include Haiti, Rwanda, Burundi, Lesotho, Mexico, Guatemala, and inner city Boston. She also consults with the World Health Organization on the treatment of HIV and multidrug resistant tuberculosis in developing countries. Um, she's a member of the executive board of Health Action AIDS, which is a campaign conducted with physicians for human rights to engage the U.S. health professional community in the international advocacy and education effort to stop the global AIDS pandemic. In reality, though, her interests transcend the labels of global health and equitable access, you know, all the big buzzwords that are used today and are more justly described as simply human. Before Dr. Mukherjee started her path of studying medicine, she attended Harbor Fields High School in Green Lawn, New York, and was a cheerleader and a Girl Scout. She specifically asked me to say this tonight. Uh, she then trained in infectious disease, internal medicine, and pediatrics. She also has a Master of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. She's an associate professor in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, where she also teaches medical students, residents, and fellows in the fields of infectious disease, global health, and health disparities. She has received numerous awards and honors in academia, global health care, and community service throughout the years. Notably, in 2007, uh, she received an honorary doctor of human letters here from the University of Rhode Island. Tonight, she will talk about the case of health care as, as a human right, and I would like to invite her to come to the podium. Yeah. So that was for you, Lori. I mean, you know, these days I, I hide much more of the cheerleader side than the Girl Scout side. I mean, in the old days we had to do the other way around. But anyway, one of my closest friends from high school is here. We haven't seen each other in 26 years. But, you know, we're only 28. But. Um, anyway, tonight, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be back at University of Rhode Island. And uh, since you all gave me a degree, I feel um, pretty much like an alumni. This is actually my third uh, visit to the University of Rhode Island in the last six years, and it's been really wonderful. I'm a huge uh, supporter of public education and went to uh, largely public schools until that little master's degree at Harvard. Um, and I've had, uh, you know, I think really an important um, feeling about public education, particularly in regards to diversity. I think as we look at education, it's so important to health. Um, and at Partners in Health, we feel that health and education absolutely go hand in hand, not only educating people about their health, but the access to basic education as a way for people to move up the social ladder um, which definitely has incredible impacts on their health. So, you know, again, it's a real honor for me to be here, and I really didn't realize how close Kingston was until I took the train today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about disparities in healthcare, and particularly from the perspective of my organization, Partners in Health, which is in its 25th year this year. Um, and use Partners in Health as an example, because it's one I know well from working uh, 13 years for Partners in Health, um, as an example of how we've seen movement toward social change and toward reducing disparities in health 
in the last decade, decade and a half. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but I think, at least I hope, that this will be an encouraging thing to all of you who care about positive changes that we can bring about in this millennium and to be part of the positive side of globalization, which often has quite a negative connotation. Um, and forward is, no, pointer, there. So anybody, and even with this bigger crowd, I'm still going to ask you to yell stuff out. Sorry, it's just my way. Um, does anyone know what this map is of? Yes. Yes, and that waterborne disease was cholera, right. So this is a very famous map in public health. It was made by a guy named John Snow. John Snow is arguably the father of public health. John Snow found cases of cholera all over the city of London in the, in the turn of the century, the last century, and mapped them out. And what he found was this that there were a concentration of cases of cholera in this one area. And so he said, aha, now b back then there was no epidemiology as a study. Is my earring banging on this thing? I can take it out. Um, just don't let me forget it. Um, there was no epidemiology as a study, right? So he was the father of this, of looking at data, of deciding based on the data where the problem was and taking action. So he did something pretty simple. Does anybody know what he did? He did it right here. But it didn't look like that back then. I don't think they had iron grates. But he took the handle off the pump, right? So what he saw was that water that was coming downstream from the Thames was contaminated and contaminating this water pump on Broad Street in London. Jon Snow took the handle off the pump. And voila, what happened? Well, not that clear. Why is it not that clear? Well, certainly cases of cholera associated with this pump went down. right? And everyone looks at this as, this is public health as is best. But there's a problem here. The people who lived in this area had no other access to water. If you're a mother, and you have five kids, and you're taking in sewing, and this is your access to water, now what are you going to do? Yeah, therein lies the rub. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because I have a degree in public health, I like public health, but public health only gets us so far. Because if we don't address the overall disparities, the living conditions, the social determinants of health, it's very difficult for one single public health intervention to work. And I think often this story and many others in public health are told with a certain kind of victory narrative that subverts the real truth that we have growing inequality and growing disparities in the world. So when Jon Snow took the handle off this pump, there were probably still people who died of cholera because cholera was in the water supply. They didn't die right around this pump. Now, Fast forward a good 150 years, OK? I work in Haiti, um, a country I love. Um, I love the history of Haiti. I love the people of Haiti. I've learned more in Haiti about the world and humanity than I will ever learn from any other place. But in 2010, we had the sudden outbreak of profuse, watery diarrhea among adults with a death rate of 10%. Now, my team in Haiti is 5,000 Haitian people. Many doctors, many nurses, many community health workers, they know how to treat diarrhea. They had never seen anything like that, never. Adults dying of diarrhea within 15 minutes of presenting to the hospital. We had a hospital full of 900 people with profuse, watery diarrhea dying, 10, 12% of them dying in an hour with, of presenting, OK? So if we were Jon Snow, we'd say, where's that pump? Right? So we went and looked for the pump, and it turned out it was cholera. There was no pump. 
The contamination was in the whole of the Artibonite River, which is the main source of water for about 3 million people in Haiti. So now what? That's the end of the strategy in many cases. That's the end of the strategy. Prevention is better than cure, sometimes people say. That's what I heard in Africa all the time. That's what they teach kids. Prevention is better than cure. And you know, as a doctor, I can say, well, that might be true, but not if you have the disease. Right? Kind of too late for prevention. We've got 900 people suffering from cholera. We're going to have to treat them. We're going to have to treat them so their kids don't become orphans, so they don't die. right? And so they don't continue to contaminate others. Uh, the water supply, et cetera. So what, to me, this is an example of where we need to go in the US and globally to address health disparities. Move from a public health approach, which is important, but doesn't look at the whole picture, to an approach of delivering health care in a way that addresses the social determinants of health, has an equity agenda with it, and actually is treating the burden of disease, not just preventing disease, but treating disease. For many of you in this audience, young people, you might want to go to medical school, nursing school. Some of you are physicians and nurses yourself. Many of you want to work in other areas. But I didn't become a doctor to prevent disease. I like to prevent disease, and I've arguably handed out more condoms than you know most people of Indian descent um, with conservative fathers. Um, but, <laughs> but I also know that when somebody comes to me who has HIV, I want to give them the treatment they need that can prolong their life. There was no space for that in public health until recently. So, when we look at partners in health, at the, the idea of global health delivery, we want to deliver medical care toward the burden of disease, addressing the root causes, and have an equity agenda. Not pat ourselves in the back for an 80% vaccination rate, because we know that the 20% of kids that don't get vaccinated are always the ones that don't get whatever it is, food, shelter, water, vaccination, right? So equity agenda. So, I'm going to walk you through the Partners in Health timeline. And in that example, I'm going to show you, sort of share with you what we've learned about health care and health as a right and addressing disparities and how it relates here also. So first of all, Partners in Health was founded in 1987. And, and what most of you who've, who's read Mountains Beyond Mountains? Okay, well, oh, whoo, all right. I'm not in Mountains Beyond Mountains, which I'm happy about. So the person in there is not me. That's Ophelia Dahl. Um, it, and Mountains by Mountains, Tracy finished up writing that book in 99. I started in 99. Um, but let me tell you, what you read about in Partners in Health, you'll see in this first couple examples. But since that time, we've also had a lot of movement in a, in a direction that is more even yet in the direction of health as a human right. So in the first part of the story of Partners in Health, what you see is a real dedication to community organizing, to working with local people to address their needs. This is kind of bread and butter, very good human rights work to, to organize community and, and educate people about their rights, about what they should expect, what they should try to meet their needs. Um, this also came very much from the Latin American progressive social movements of the time, liberation theology, um, and some of the, the more sort of uh, grassroots organizing tech, techniques of the church and, and also uh, educators like Paolo Freire. So our, a lot of our work in this period was really accompanying people, communities, walking with people. Here you see community health workers taking children to be HIV tested. Here you see nurses going to visit shanty towns in Peru. Here you see me, no, <laughs> with community health workers in Chiapas, Mexico. And I like to even throw in a gratuitous picture of a community health worker in Siberia. Because yes, we actually work in Siberia too. So even though there are doctors and nurses, there are still huge health disparities. Um, and then this is one of my 
very close friends who's a Haitian doctor working in Africa going on home visits by horse. He had to learn to ride a horse in Africa uh, to do that. So this early experience really embedded partners in health with the community. And today, when I started, we had one hospital in Haiti, um, about 75 patients in Peru, and a staff of about 250. Today, we have 14,000 employees around the world, and only 100 of them are American. So it is very much a locally owned and operated organization, and 80% of our employees are themselves the rural poor. So we are constantly being kept honest by the communities we serve, because there is no us and them, there's just a we. So that was the early experience, and a lot of this health care at this time was really just basic primary health care, making sure people didn't die of malaria or tuberculosis, some of the things that we can, in fact, treat. So in 1994, and some of this is in Mountains Beyond Mountains, there was a priest in Boston who was a good friend of Paul Farmer's and invited Paul and Jim Kim to come to Peru and do the same kind of community organizing and community-based health care in Peru that they had done in Haiti. So a lot of walking with people in the community to these places, these shanty towns in Lima. Now, Peru is not Haiti. It's not a, a super poor country. It's a second world country. It's a middle income country. But what you see in Peru and throughout Latin America is profound inequality. So you can have a Starbucks and a KFC, and you can have this coexisting within three blocks of each other. You don't see that in Haiti. You don't see that in places in Africa, some places. What we found, though, to our surprise, was a lot of people in this very poor community, the slums of northern Lima and Caraballo, had tuberculosis. But they not only had tuberculosis, they had a highly resistant form of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So, and it was one guy who was the index case, and this whole family who lives in a house about this big, who all had, shockingly or not, the same strain of tuberculosis. So we did, the, we did our John Snow map, OK? Here's seven cases. Here's one house. So what do you do? Yeah, you could get rid of the doctor. That might work. What else? What, what, what are you going to do about that? Yeah, it's puzzling, right? It's not simple. It's not simple. So we went to the government of Peru and said, you know, what about this? They said, we don't have drug-resistant tuberculosis in Peru. We don't have it. It doesn't exist. We have a really good tuberculosis program. See, we've won all these medals from the World Health Organization. We have the best tuberculosis control program in the world. So we don't have drug-resistant TB. So well, that's funny, because these 10 people and six of their neighbors and three of their cousins and seven of their uh, you know, storekeepers in this town, this, this slum, have drug-resistant tuberculosis. So, since we're a social justice organization, since we started from the community, even though people in charge are saying, we don't have that problem, we said, well, these guys have these problems, and this is us, right? There's no us and them, is we. These are our community health workers. These are our friends. These are our nurses and their families, right? So we did what I would have done at the Mass General Hospital, where I did my infectious disease fellowship. We treated the patients. Drug-resistant TB is treatable. It's not easy to treat. Much harder than HIV, I can tell you that, having treated a lot of both. So we treated these people. Well, turns out that that put vaulted partners in health from a fairly small, solidarity-based Latin American organization onto the global stage. Why do you think that is? We treated like, you know, 10 patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis. I mean, New York City had a couple hundred. Yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, so the World Health Organization had a certain plan. That plan was called Directly Observed Therapy Short Course. The motto of the tuberculosis plan was DOTS, which is the, the uh, acronym. DOTS cures all. These people all were getting DOTS. They were taking their drugs religiously, and they weren't getting better. So when we started to say, well, you know, they're not getting better because they have drug-resistant TB, and we can prove it because we did their cultures in Massachusetts, um, they said, well, you can't do that because that's not part of our paradigm. It's not part of our paradigm. So why would they care? I mean, we got the proof. We got the treatment. We had a rich, wonderful person who paid for the drugs. Nobody is not costing them anything. It's not costing the patients anything. It's not costing the government of Peru anything. So why were they worried? Because it caused a huge amount of controversy. What's that? Then everyone will expect it. How can you treat these people? So we were in this, sort of forced into this dilemma that supposedly was ethics. If you have all this tuberculosis in Peru, why would you treat these people? But then the question is, why not? Are their lives not worth saving? They're poor. They're largely indigenous. Some of our early patients didn't even speak Spanish. right? They spoke Quechua. It was the international community saying something about those people not being worth the treatment. They indeed were, because this was all about cost. The cost of this treatment early on was $30,000 per patient to cure them. And people said, just too much. You can't do it. Sorry. The head of tuberculosis at the WHO actually said, poor people are just going to have to die, because this is just too expensive. End of story. So what do you do? You listen to that? Do you listen to that conventional wisdom? Certainly no poor person I've ever taken care of said, you know, I'm too miserable to really count, so don't bother treating me. Right? If you listen to the affected, they're never going to say that. If you're really aligning yourself with the people who are suffering, you're never going to hear that I am not cost effective. If people say that, you think they probably have some kind of you know, psychotic break, because nobody is going to say that about their children, about their grandmothers. They're not going to say that. Right? So I think the first step we took early on was aligning ourselves with the poor, listening to affected people, and then treating the burden of disease. And in this particular community, there was a lot of drug-resistant TB. Now, I'm also, as you saw, strangely enough, on the faculty of Harvard. So, we thought, well, how can we leverage what we know to be the standard of care in the United States with what's going on in urban Lima, in the slums of Lima? So we kind of walked through a couple of different scenarios. Well, we could do a study. So we commissioned a study that was uh, supported by the uh, Soros Foundation to look at the actual impact globally of drug-resistant tuberculosis, saying at least we can show there would be really an impact. Now, of course, we're again doing it from a very moral perspective. But we could say there's an impact. And we showed in 57 different countries that drug-resistant tuberculosis existed despite a program of tuberculosis control, and that you use models to predict that if we don't treat this, this is going to become the dominant strain. So that helped us. And then we worked with the WHO, actually, to say, we have to do this. So we garnered enough support to, to do this. And part of it was really just demonstrating the scope of the problem. And so a lot of my research, if you want to call that, is just documenting the scope of some of these problems among poor people. Because part of the, the strategy of not providing care is to hide the problems, right? We all know that. At least all of us who are parents know that. You know, if kids hide, I didn't do that. You know, so as long as we keep the problems hidden, then there's not a compulsion to act. So, so part of our strategy of 
linking academic work with the moral mission of trying to get healthcare equity is first and foremost showing the actual scope and impact of the problem. Um, similarly, about that time, in 94, I was in Uganda treating HIV, or excuse me, uh, preventing, doing HIV prevention programs with young people, kids from 11 to 14 years old in a rural community in, in Uganda. And at that time, there was no treatment for HIV for uh, anywhere, right? That was 94, so there was no cocktail. So AIDS was universally fatal back then. And uh, we worked in 92 different schools teaching kids 11 to 14 years old how they could prevent themselves from getting infected, how HIV was transmitted, all of the different things they needed to know. And yet most of the focus of HIV at the time was this just education. Protect your virginity, just say no. But when we asked these children, again, ask the children, ask the people, ask the community that's affected, what are your main risk factors for HIV? Even after they have had all this education, understand how HIV is transmitted, prevented, et cetera, what do they say their number one risk factor is poverty? So I could have, I was already a physician, I could have said, wow, these people are ignorant. I'm going back home where people understand education and they say what you want to hear, right? But instead I thought, well, I'm supposed to be listening to the community. What do they mean by that? What do you mean by that? I said to these kids, I, you know, lived in the same community I did. They said, well, auntie, you know, I'm already an orphan. The, the HIV prevalence in this community was 35%. Many of these kids had already lost one or two parents. And auntie, I'm already an orphan, and you know, school is not free. So if I don't learn to read and write, I'm going to end up as a slave, a servant. I will definitely be raped. I will definitely get HIV. If I get to go to school, maybe something better can come of my life. If I can learn to read and write and do mathematics, maybe something better can come of my life than that. But there's no way for me to do that unless someone will pay for school for me. So if this man from down the street, who's a neighbor, who's a, just presumably a decent fellow, he says he'll pay for my school if I have a relationship with him, I'm going to do that. Is that a bad choice? It's horrible to have to make that choice. But what I learned from these kids was poverty is an underlying risk factor for just about every disease and complication you can imagine. You know? Even to diseases that are genetic in nature. If you're poor, you're going to get them worse. You're going to have more complications. If you have no access to care, I was telling the students earlier, there's an epidemic in the Bronx of footlessness. Just about access to care for diabetes. So I came back thinking, my God, like here I am doing HIV prevention. These kids are teaching me like poverty is our constraint. So 95, I come back in 95, and 95 was the year that the cocktail antiretroviral therapy was kind of recognized to be this incredible treatment for HIV. Many of us who were treating HIV at the time saw people literally get off their deathbeds, graduate from law school, you know, go back to work. Uh, many are still living today who are those early patients. Some of them are very good friends of mine, AIDS activists themselves. So I thought certainly we'll start giving this medicine out in Africa because there were 26 million people in the world at that time in 1995 who had HIV. 95% of them were in sub-Saharan Africa. I had been to 200 funerals in the span of two years, and I thought, well, clearly, people are going to move with this. Nothing. Not 96, not 97, not 98, not 99. And finally, I thought I had come to Harvard just to do global AIDS, and this is crazy. Nobody is talking about treatment in Africa. So I looked around, and I 
you know, stumbled on this little rinky-dink NGO called Partners in Health um, with one guy, Paul. Jim Kim was moonlighting to pay his salary at the Brigham. He's now head of the World Bank. Um, been a ride. And uh, I said, look, I'll work for you guys for free. Because they, they were treating about 10, 20 patients in Haiti with antiretrovirals. I thought, I'll work for you guys for free. And soon, there'll be so much treatment in Africa that I'll go back. Well, that didn't happen. That was 13 years ago. But similarly, OK, with HIV, what we started to do was show the scope of the problem. By 99, the epidemic was 32 million, and no one was being treated. Fewer than 50,000 people in sub-Saharan Africa had any access to treatment, and it was all very expensive. There was no free treatment, no treatment in the public sector, no treatment for poor people. And the large majority of people who have AIDS are poor. So we similarly wrote papers to show the scale of the epidemic, because before that, nobody really talked about AIDS and epidemic in the same sentence. As American providers, we were talking about AIDS patients, one patient at a time. But nobody was looking at the big picture and the collapse of societies under the weight of HIV. So we worked really hard to say, we've got to treat people. We wrote a little paper saying, you know, we treated a handful of patients in, in Haiti, and they all gained weight, and, and, you know, they did better. And it was published in a prestigious journal called The Lancet. And this paper, which is still probably the most cited paper that our group has ever written, um, this paper was roundly despised. There, if there's one thing nerdier than a Girl Scout cheerleader, it's academic hate mail. You didn't have data. You didn't do, you know, please, you know. Why do you think people hated this paper? Hated, hated, hated the paper. They invited us to write a second paper just so they could criticize it. It was written, I'm not kidding. I, it was in the WHO bulletin in this section called Roundtable where you write a paper and then everyone takes pot shots at you. Okay, so why do you think people hated this paper so much? Yes. Yeah, too expensive, not feasible. Too expensive, not feasible. Silly, gold-plated, Paul Farmer's a nut, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and an indictment of the status quo. Is it OK? Imagine for a minute, if it wasn't HIV, that we are living in a global epidemic that is destroying our society, that is orphaning children by the millions. And China has a treatment for that. And they say, eh, you guys can't afford it. Right? It's laughable, right? Absolutely laughable. And yet that's what was happening. That is what was happening. And it challenged the status quo of for-profit medicines for epidemic diseases. Right? Um, so we had a big win here. And the big win was with that little paper that said we treated 60 patients in Haiti and they got better. Academics hated it, but there were people who loved that paper, and they were HIV activists. They said, oh, they can do it in Haiti, we can do it in Soweto. They can do it in Haiti, we can do it in Bangkok. They can do it in Haiti, we can do it in Uganda. And suddenly, we became part of a movement for global AIDS treatment access. We were not the creators of the movement, but we became part of that. We became the data arm. We became the proof of concept. People would talk about the Haiti model. It wasn't really even a model. And this is something that we had never seen before. These are AIDS activists in Durban, South Africa, in the year 2000, shutting down the Global AIDS Conference, saying, we want access to treatment. We're HIV positive. We know that treatment will save our lives. And you are not giving it to us because we're black and we're poor. And we won't stand it anymore. 
And African leaders, African countries like Mozambique, like Tanzania said, you know what? We're not going to take out any more of your loans to treat this epidemic. That's just going to further indebt us, further impoverish us. You have some responsibility to help us treat people, global community. So Kofi Annan, who was at the time the head of the UN, called in the UN General Assembly special session on AIDS for the creation of something that had never, ever been seen before, which was a pot of money for multilateral assistance to provide a human right. In this case, it was access to HIV treatment. And that pot of money is called the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. It's not political. It's not tied with any government agenda. It's a pot of money. It's a coffer. Donor countries, corporations, others can put money in there. And then governments and civil society can write proposals to how they're going to treat and prevent HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. And the money flows from north to south. When we, we were our organization, Partners in Health, and, and Haiti actually won money, won an award um, in the first round of the Global Fund. And uh, at the time, like I said, we had one little charity hospital in central Haiti, tiny little staff. We made a very strategic decision when we heard that we had gotten this money. And that was, we said, you know what? We've been working with community for years. We believe that community engagement is a critical part of human rights agenda. But if healthcare is to be delivered as a human right, it must be delivered through the public sector so that people have a say in what they're getting, so that it's embedded in the democratic process. So it's not dependent on charity and goodwill, but rather part of their right as a citizen, as a human. So Partners in Health that year, the year 2002, decided that any money we were awarded from the Global Fund, we would invest in the public sector in Haiti. So since that time, since 2002, when we had one charity hospital, we now support 70 public clinics around the world in 10 different countries. We said HIV treatment has to be a right. It has to have both community engagement and the participation of the public sector. And most public governments, governments are too poor in research poor settings to deliver on, their, on healthcare as a right without the help of the international community. So we said, this is money from the international community. It should go to fund this right, and it should rebuild the public sector in Haiti. But we went one step further than that, too. We said, actually, we don't care about HIV. HIV only affects about 4% of Haitians. Um, but we're going to use the attention, the money, the activism around HIV to rebuild the public sector in Haiti. We can't find cases of HIV if the clinic is closed. right? We can't treat HIV if we have no doctors or nurses. So we use that money to do four things. First, we actually found these public clinics. And we paid the staff. In many cases, there were staff posted to these clinics, paid by the Haitian government. But the Haitian government, being bankrupt, hadn't paid people in nine months. One of the first days I was in one of our clinics, there was a guy. He looked kind of familiar. He was selling radios in the market. And I said, hey, aren't you our doctor? He said, yeah. I said, so what's up with the radio shack thing? He said, well, you know, I've got three kids. I need to pay their tuition. I haven't been paid in nine months. And I thought, my god, this is a country where people don't live past their 45th birthday. This is a talented, smart doctor who is being forced to sell radios in the market because nobody internationally values the provision of health care as a basic human right. So we brought back a lot of the public sector employees, worked with the government to pay them a living wage, thing one. Thing two, we used a lot of HIV money to buy essential drugs. Because nobody comes to clinic because they want to know if they have HIV or any other single disease. They come because they're sick. Particularly in poor countries where people are peasant farmers, they're walking six, seven hours to get to health care. They want to know that there'll be somebody can, to meet them and drugs for them. So we 
incapacitated the pharmacy. The third thing we did was get rid of the fees for service because the Haitian government and every other poor go government in the world is too poor to provide health care, so they try to do cost recovery, which never puts enough money into the coffers and serves as a barrier to people utilizing services. So we got rid of that. So, you know, the amount of money you take in is inconsequential anyway, don't worry about it. And then the fourth thing we did is hire, train, retain an army of community health workers to go out and do active case finding. Not active case finding for HIV. Again, we didn't care about HIV. Active case finding for vulnerability. And you still, if you're ever with me in Haiti, community health workers will come up to any one of our doctors or nurses and say, Doc, you got to come with me. There's a lady with no leg. This kid is bedridden. This person is really swollen. We don't care if they have AIDS. We care that they need health care. And that active case finding of the vulnerable, that movement toward equity, has to come from the community. There is no way we can sit passively in any position of power, in any health clinic, in any university, and know what's going on with the lives of the vulnerable. So we put this strategy into place of recapacitating the public sector and working together with community as community health workers. And it was that work that resulted in Partners in Health being invited to Africa. Because African governments saw money coming in and all these NGOs, non-governmental organizations, charities, just proliferating for money. And they said, but what about our health system? Our health system is bankrupt. They said, we want a charity, an NGO, that's going to help us build our health system better. We want the money to come to us as a government, and any partners we have in the country should help our agenda. And so we, um, based on that work, ended up, sorry, going to um, Rwanda. So let me just, a uh, couple things, sorry, sorry, these two slides are out of order. This was a paper we published in 2002, just looking at the outcome gap among people living with HIV. The whole purpose of this publication was to get this graph published so that people would see the profound death toll. Because it wasn't well known at the time in 2001. This was a picture from our paper that showed these handful of patients that actually got better with antiretroviral therapy. And interestingly enough, in the case of tuberculosis, drug-resistant tuberculosis, and in the case of HIV, this cost that everyone was so afraid of, we found was totally fungible. Right? So at the time we started treating MDR-TB, drug-resistant TB, as I said, the treatment was $30,000 per patient per year. Today it's about $2,300. Why is that? Why did the price go down like that? No, it, it, the thing with MDR-TB, not a one of the drugs was on patent. Not one. Well, two of them were on patent, so I shouldn't say not one, but not one that we had to pay for. The patented drugs they gave to us and eventually took off patent because nobody used them. Nobody cares about MDRTB. Mass production. So if you have no demand, nobody's going to produce the drugs. So if the drugs are thought to be, oh, you can't possibly treat this disease in a poor country, and the poor country are the only ones that have the disease, that's the end of the production line. That's what we call a market failure, right? The market fails where you're only looking at market solutions to ramp up drug production. So with MDRTB, we put the drugs on the WHO essential drug list. Once they were on there, we advocated at country level in different countries from India to, to Korea, to Rwanda, to South Africa, to say, you've got this problem. You need to put this in your budget. And once it looked like countries were going to start committing to treating this, production went up. Production of generic drugs, drugs that were not on patent. So that price dropped. HIV, it was more complicated, because all of the drugs were on patent. And that's a long story I'm probably not going to have time to do today. But but with activism and advocacy and, and very uh, hard-bitten 
human rights framing of international treaties, we were able to drop the price of drugs from $10,000 a patient per year to 80. When you see a hundredfold price drop in a span of five years, you think you're doing something right, right? So again, once we were able to kind of show there was a market, write guidelines, work with the WHO, say these things are important, work with countries and activists to say we're going to do this, and then the money comes, the whole playing field changed. So the idea that something's not feasible because it's too expensive is just a failure of imagination. Right? Um, the creation of the Global Fund was then followed by a big bilateral uh, assistance program called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief under President George W. Bush. Um, and at the WHO, the 3 by 5 initiative, which was to say treat 3 million people with HIV by 2005. Now, remember, when that declaration was made, less than 50,000 people were given treatment. So it was this crazily ambitious goal. Today, in the year 2012, I'm happy to tell you that there are 6.2 million people receiving antiretroviral therapy all over the world for free. That, yeah, do it. That is a victory of activism, of advocacy, of, of really looking at disparities, finding solutions, and being tenaciously committed to a human rights approach that both engages civil society and provides treatment in the public sector. No single charity alone could have gotten to 6.2 million. That had to be public health approach. It had to be a government-enabled right. So, we started saying, look, we can do this. And we've done it in Rwanda, in Lesotho, in Malawi. We've provided technical assistance in Ethiopia, in Swaziland, in Ghana. Um, and often with our local Haitian staff as the experts. This is one of my best friends, Frené Leon, um, who's our executive director in Haiti, in Rwanda, helping us, the Rwanda, uh, Rwandan government, to set up an equitable HIV treatment program. This is. Jonas uh, Rigadon, who's also Haitian, had worked with us for 10 years, then went to Lesotho to set up clinics in the mountains of rural Lesotho for and with the government of Lesotho. Right? So building capacity in Haiti also was able to help us strengthen capacity in Africa. It wasn't just training a handful of Americans to go out and do good things. There was a strategy about building the proper capacity to provide services in areas where the health disparities are great. So this is uh, what I was telling you about. This, this was uh, from a paper when we showed this capacitation of the public sector with HIV money. So now we never randomized for the rainbow-colored awning. So some of my colleagues might critique that, because this wasn't a randomized controlled trial. But the difference between this clinic here and here were those four things. Staff, stuff, community health workers, and getting rid of user fee. And you went from a clinic that saw fewer than five patients a day to a clinic that still today sees more than 250. And that's not for HIV, that's just for everything. For tuberculosis, for pneumonia, for diarrhea, for whatever. And gave us the infrastructure then to treat cholera, gave us the infrastructure then to treat people who needed orthopedic surgery after the earthquake. Right? We actually had a health facility. We weren't just running around you know, with a backpack giving vaccines. We actually had operating rooms, anesthesia, surgeons. So when the earthquake hit Haiti, even though our clinics were very much up country, we did more than 2,000 surgeries because we had health infrastructure, because our plan was never about AIDS. Right? It was about health infrastructure. So this public sector model was part of our rights-based strategy that really came later, that really came in 2002, 2003, and has served us, I think, very well in terms of scale. It's challenging. It's, it's easier to do things as a charity on your own, right? to be sure. But it isn't a human rights framework. So today, where are we? Well, you know, I think 
We believe that there is growing interest among young people to say we want to be part of changing in a systematic way, not just providing charity, which is good. I like charity, right? I work for charity. But to really provide systems that are tenable to deliver health care toward the burden of disease, addressing equity and social determinants. And so we're doing more and more capacity building in poor countries, capacity building here in the US, capacity building in the United States that's linked to fellow students and trainees in Haiti or in Rwanda. And we feel like this is the way to really increase the level of care. So this is a teaching hospital we're building in Haiti, um, it, which is Partners in Health's major sort of contribution to the post-earthquake uh, uh, Re rebuilding of the country. This is um, a new program in Rwanda called Human Resources for Health, where we are brokering 17 US universities, medical schools, and nursing schools to train the next generation of Rwandans, because most of their specialists were killed uh, in the war. And this is actually a public hospital in Haiti that we have started family practice and nurse auxiliary training in as a way to improve the level of services, the quality of services. So, all of these things are to say, this is not about one man's quest. I think that's the subtitle of Mountains Young Mountains. I lo love that one man. But it's not about one man's quest. It's about how do we build a movement that will have the proper capacity to deliver health care as a basic right. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of challenges, because we are facing increasing inequity on the planet. We have a long way to go. And in the year 2000, all of the member countries of the UN signed on to something called the Millennium Development Goals. And yes, one of the goals is a teddy bear. Um, the Millennium, it's not really, I'm just kidding. The, the Millennium Development Goals are about poverty alleviation, about the end to extreme poverty. And they include food security, education, women's rights, child health, women's reproductive health, access to medicines, some environmental sustainability issues, and a partnership for development. And I think if there's one goal that's least talked about and probably most important, it's that one. Because if we don't have a global funding strategy to meet this challenge, we will fail. This cannot be done with like elbow grease and you know, good wishes. Like We have to have money. And so the one Millennium Development Goal that is on track is access to HIV treatment. And that's because of the Global Fund. So we need to fight harder in a partnership between rich countries and poor countries to put money into achieving health care and basic human dignity as, as a human right. So we have a couple of ideas about how to do this. This is a wonky slide. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have put this in there. No pictures, nothing. But and one of the things is we can integrate health care. If we leave everything toward vertical funding of, OK, let's have a food security program. Let's have an HIV program. We believe that integrating a strategy toward development is important. And you see that in poor communities here, where you have a health clinic and a school, right? where you have a workplace and a crash. I mean, if you don't package these things, they are not going to serve the poor. You make it too complicated. Um, one of the things, that, there, there are two documents that I, I, I highlight on this slide. One is the UNICEF report from 2010, which says an interesting thing. Achieving the MDGs with equity. So UNICEF is arguably one of the best organizations in the UN family. They care deeply about children. But they are the ones who've said, we are not going to take 90% vaccination rate as a success anymore. Because that isn't equity. Who are those 10% of kids? Is it acceptable to have a 10% death rate in any community? Of course not. And so it shouldn't be acceptable to have that kind of disparity. And then the other thing was this interesting piece written by Atul Gawande in The New Yorker, less than, less than six months later, called Hotspotters. And it was about Camden, New Jersey. And it was talking about equity that here you have Camden, New Jersey, in the shadow of lots of money, and terrible health, health outcomes that can be mapped 
to the poorest communities, the most disenfranchised communities. And if you could address vulnerability at the community level, you could achieve equity. Both of these things, one international, one here at home, suggest the need for community health workers, for these agents of health, of well-being, of development, who will go out and work together with the communities to achieve solutions, to bring people to care, to find out what are the struggles families are having. This is a map of you know, how we look at community health workers. They are an extension of the health center, of the district hospital. So I'm going to end with just an example from probably the most challenging environment we work, which is the mountains of Lesotho. The mountains of Lesotho are the only place in Africa where it snows on a regular basis. Really, it snows. I mean, it's hot in the summer, and it is freezing in the winter. There are no roads in some, to some of these clinics, and we fly in and out on Cessnas. Right? And the HIV prevalence is 26%. So in these communities, how are we possibly going to meet the MDGs? Well, obviously, finding HIV cases, treating HIV. But the most complicated Millennium Development Goal to achieve in health is the reduction of maternal mortality. Why? What do women die of if they die in childbirth? Why do they die? Hemorrhage. So you need a blood bank. Put a blood bank in rural Lesotho up in the mountains. What else do you need? Midwives, trained midwives, somebody who can actually get the baby out. And if the midwife can't do it, what do you need? I'd show you my scar, but that would be unseemly. A C-section. You need a surgeon. You need anesthesia. So part of the reason the world is failing so badly in reducing maternal mortality is it's complicated. Prenatal care does not affect maternal survival. So it affects neonatal survival. Um, but, but so these things, blood, C-section, antibiotics, these are things you actually need a trained workforce to deliver. And we've been able to achieve this incredible rate of facility-based births of 100% in some of these most rural clinics in Lesotho. Why? Because there are community health workers involved. And they go and get women and bring them to every one of their antenatal visits and make sure they deliver in the hospital. And if, they, and if there's complications, they're referred to a place that can do blood and C-section. So once you bring together these strategies of building capacity, rebuilding the health sector, engaging community health workers, then you have a chance of meeting the MDGs. But you can't do it one disease or one intervention at a time. So um, I want to say that you know the, there was a, a, a good friend of mine who, who died a couple years ago, who was 91. His name is Dr. Julius Richmond. He was Surgeon General under Johnson and Carter. He was one of the founders of Head Start. Um, and he also was the Surgeon General that took on Big Tobacco. He was, he was about this big. Amazing person. And he said, there is a way to achieve social change. You have to first show the scientific knowledge base. You have to get rid of the doubts in people's mind that things can be done, that things are a problem. Because there will always be naysayers. Like the, like the government approved, we don't have MDRTB. So you need to show it. You need to show it. People didn't believe we could treat HIV in rural Haiti. We need to show it. So that scientific knowledge base is very important, but it's not the end of the story. There's lots of great scientific research that stays in giant file cabinets in, this, in the cloud that never is interpreted. So what do you need? Then you need a social strategy for change. For us in HIV, that social strategy was working with activists. But it won't always be activists. It, it might be other things. And it won't always be activists living with the disease. I wish that every mother in the world could become activists around the fact that 24,000 kids die every day before their fifth birthday. If we could get a campaign, these are preventable deaths. These are totally preventable. So we need a strategy for social change that is going to get rid of extreme poverty. Because it's possible. It's possible for 50 to 70 bucks per capita per year. That's not a lot of money. 
That's a couple weeks in Iraq. Right? This is possible. This is not beyond the reach of humanity. Right? And I hope that the next generation, these wonderful undergraduates I see here and everywhere I go, in Africa and elsewhere, are going to say, you know what, we want to live in a world that doesn't have extreme poverty. I want to tell my grandchildren that, you know, when I, when I was young, kids died of malnutrition. They say, oh, come on, Grandma. You know, did you hunt dinosaurs too? Like, I want that response, right? We, we, we live in a world that doesn't have the same kind of segregation it used to. We live in a world that doesn't have the transatlantic slave trade. We live in a world that has independence and the end of colonialism in Africa. These big changes can happen, and we can end extreme poverty. But we have to have a strategy for social change. And then the last and probably most important thing is to have that strategy connected with changing political will. We have to have an ask. And it's difficult to do what I do and live in a country where healthcare is not a right. Um, we got to start it here at home. We, you know, we, we can't have, yeah. I mean, some of the worst health disparities on the planet are right here in the US. So if we can't take that social strategy and say these basic things, healthcare, education, et cetera, are human rights, and we can measure them by looking at disparities and the disappearance of disparities, that, that we won't achieve anything. So you know, these are ladies in Lesotho. The large majority of them are living with HIV. They themselves are community health workers. They themselves are walking six, seven hours a day to visit people in their villages, to get to the health center. If they can do it, we have to do it. Right? We're lame if we are so cynical that we don't have the same burning desire as these ladies who are often taking care of five or six orphans, have HIV, and are still out there working every day to better not only their own lives and their own families, but the lives of others. So thank you very much. I know there's a high-tech Q&A going on here. Okay. Do, <laughs> do you ever talk to colleagues in the Harvard Economics Department about the effects of the IMF and the World Bank policies they write in support all the time? I mean, we have to understand that a lot of the impoverishment of the public sector is a direct consequence of the policies of the World Bank and the IMF. Partners in Health has written a lot about it. And uh, one of the founders of Partners in Health recently became head of the World Bank, so I'm hoping that we will see a change. If poverty is the number one risk factor for contracting HIV in Africa, then is it merely a question of money? And if so, what is the most effective way in your experience to utilize funding? Um, I think poverty is the number one risk factor, but it's not merely a question of money because it, you have to address inequality. The, 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 it's, it's the unequal distribution of resources that's the, the real uh, driving factor. So we have to actually try to um, de lessen inequality, and we know that one of the very best ways to do that is educating girls. So education has to be absolutely central to everything we do, and I guess half the sky, the second half of half the sky is tonight, so do watch that. But education is very important. Access to uh, health care is important, um, so it's not just money. Do you believe that if developed countries subsidize the production of the drugs that treat HIV, TB, and malaria, it would, it would create a more stable market price for these drugs rather than relying on working directly with the governments of developed countries to increase the quantity demanded of these drugs? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's uh, well, developed countries at this point are subsidizing the production of these drugs, even though they don't particularly like it because the money from the global fund uh, is really going to purchase generic drugs. So um, the large majority of HIV treatment in the world is generic, uh, generic drugs. Uh, and so very few governments themselves are making these drugs. Most of these drugs come from India. 
So um, India is the major source. The, the one really notable exception to this is the government of Brazil, um, who has since 91 been making their own antiretrovirals because in their constitution they have the right to health embedded in there. And so when they started to have HIV, they realized they had to constitutionally be able to treat their populace. So when the rest of the world had no treatment and all of sub-Saharan Africa had fewer than 50,000 people on treatment, Brazil alone had 250,000, and that was all with domestic production. What do you foresee happening at Partners in Health over the next 10 years? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a rough time for all, uh, for, it's a rough time for everyone. The world economy is terrible. Um, you know, philanthropic giving is down. Um, and so certainly for us, it's been a very difficult time. Of the 13 years I've worked at Partners in Health, this has been our most difficult. But I think if I had my best aspiration for 10 years from now, it wouldn't be that Partners in Health was any bigger, but that all NGOs worked within the public sector and to support civil society, that national sovereignty and national health plans were fulfilled. Um, and that more local people would be capacitated um, and compensated to do work to help their fellow citizens. Do you think health care will become a right in our country at any point in the near future? If so how do you think the best way to go about enforcing well, it? Well, the best way to enforce it, to be honest, is a public option, which was taken off the table so early on. I mean, Medicare is the closest thing we have is to a right to health. And it actually works. I mean, it's not perfect. But the overhead, administrative overhead, is only 5% compared to private insurers, which are much, much higher. So, I mean, I think there is no other real way to go. Do, do I foresee it becoming a right in our country? Uh, no, I, I'm sort of privileged in a way because I don't really work in the United States. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I'm distressed by the political climate in the United States. I'm distressed that the mere mention of, you know, people having health insurance sort of sparks calls for, you know, that Obama's a socialist. So I think our rhetoric is so divisive in this country. I just don't see how we're going to get over that impasse. But I hope that some of the people in this audience will work on that and fix it. Um, probably not where I'm going to put my effort, but it's needed, absolutely. With treatments for TB and HIV becoming more widely available for NGOs and other organizations, what do you think is the next big disease that needs to be addressed? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think any big diseases need to be addressed as much as we need to build a healthcare system. So we're, I think we've been fortunate with HIV and TB because of that, not even TB, because of HIV advocacy. It wasn't really about the disease. It was about activism and advocacy. And so um, I think we need to really sort of build health systems and eradicate extreme poverty. And that has to be the ask, not disease-focused. How do you suggest fostering cooperation and collaboration between different NGOs? Um, I think probably the best example I've seen of that is in Rwanda and where the government sort of forces the cooperation. I think, unfortunately, voluntary cooperation of anything is sort of limited whether it's corporations, governments, whatever, there has to be a framework. And the best framework we have currently is national health plans. Every poor country has a national health plan. And we need to empower governments to sort of be able to tell NGOs what to do, where to do it, and where to go if they don't want to play. And that's what happens in Rwanda, which has fewer than 200 NGOs. Whereas in Haiti, there are 12,000 and no mechanism for coordinating them. So I think the NGOs themselves are not going to sort of inherently collaborate. I think there has to be more regulation and um, sort of government control. I should say, how have your experiences in foreign countries like Rwanda, Haiti, and Peru affected your decisions to treat and help individuals living in inner city Boston? Yeah, so that for us is really about community health workers. We have our program in inner city Boston and also in the Navajo Nation using community members themselves to be agents of health and help to integrate the most vulnerable people into the health systems. Um, in Boston, we started with people living with HIV, many of whom had 
um, not been able to have a decent response to antiretroviral therapy after two or three rounds of different antiretrovirals. But having a community health worker has allowed them to have an undetectable viral load and go back to living normally. That social support is what we took from the Latin American solidarity movement and, and sort of morphed it into uh, the work we do. Now, that's happening in the United States. The one state that has a great community health worker system is Alaska. Um, and it came out of the Indian Health Service, actually. So, so these things exist. They're becoming more common. And we need to sort of restructure reimbursement so that preventive medicine and community medicine um, can actually allow people to stay at home and stay healthy rather than waiting till people fall incredibly ill and end up in the hospital. What allows you to continue to treat patients in these extremely poor areas without becoming burnt out? Yeah. Um, I would say two things. I'm definitely not burnt out. Um, and I've probably never been bad. I, I'm really clumsy still, Lori. Um, so, like, I know I'm tired when I just fall down more than one flight of st steps in a week, and then I usually rest. But I, I generally don't get burnt out. So, um, but why? I would say two things. One is I have a great team of people that I work with, and nothing really depends on me. Um, I'm a great cheerleader and friend, and as we say at Partners in Health, a company tour for many wonderful physicians, doctors, managers around the world. So, um, and we have a very, you know, rich system of collaboration. So I think the first thing is the team. And the second thing is, I think it's really important for me to remember how difficult life is for poor people around the world. And when you see the struggles of one mother taking care of three of her own children, two or three orphans, living seven hours from a health clinic, having to fetch water every day, it's kind of hard to feel a lot of sorry for yourself, you know. Um, and so for me, that does definitely help me keep my own sort of issues into perspective. What are some practical ways that people not in the medical field can help in the fight for improved health care? Well, I mean, organize. I think in the United States we need more organization. I, I was a bit embarrassed, I have to say, as an American, to see that the most organized <clears throat> discussion about the Affordable Care Act came from the Tea Party. I mean, you know, so we need to sort of organize for these things. We need to, sort of, there's no, nothing's going to change if we wait for solutions to come from the top. I and mean, we have to work and organize. Um, so that, that's a really important thing domestically. I think um, for people inter, interested in this internationally, it's just really paying attention <clears throat> to how the U.S. uses foreign assistance. I mean, we still give less than 0.1% of our overall budget to foreign development assistance. The majority of that goes to wartime types of activities and stabilization, and very, very little actually goes to health or education. We could demand different. Um, many countries, including the U.S., made a commitment at Glen Eagles in 2004 to commit 0.7% of the GDP toward health and development and education, and we're nowhere near that. So I think we should hold our own government accountable, even in these financial times. <clears throat> As a woman, do you feel that it's difficult to work in countries where your gender is underappreciated or discriminated against? Um, no, but I think, um, <clears throat> what can I say? It's diversity week. Uh, race trumps gender in almost every country in the world. Race trumps gender. The fact that I'm a white woman, I'm educated at Harvard, I don't get the kind of gender discrimination that a poor woman does or a poor black woman. So I think it's much more about social class and race than it is about gender. Gender is part of it, but I think we, if, you know, uh, in my sort of capacity as a boss of mostly men, um, <laughs> I, I really have never experienced gender discrimination in the countries I work in. Except maybe the United States. 
From what I've read, you've had, a trans, you've had transformative experiences in India and Kenya early in life. What specifically did you see that inspired you to devote your life to combating poverty and social injustice? Yeah, somebody's read my Wikipedia entry, I think, um, which I did not write. By the way. Um, yeah, so my dad was from Calcutta um, and never talked about India, was very disconnected to, from his family, he married an American, my mom. Um, and I grew up in suburban Long Island, and I was very sort of detached from poverty. Uh, I don't think our town had any poor people. I don't, not that I remember. Um, and, you know, when I was eight, my family went to India just to visit my dad's family. I mean, we didn't go for any political reason. My parents weren't social activists or anything. I mean, they were liberal Democrats. Um, and I just saw really profound poverty. Um, I saw, you know, kids my own age dying of hunger. Um, some were already dead in their mother's laps. I saw people begging uh, for alms whose fingers were falling off from leprosy. And it just left me with a very profound sense of disquiet that I carried with me for my whole life. Um, it didn't necessarily make me become a doctor. I think my parents did that. But, um, but it really sort of... Uh, broke me. And I think a lot of you um, who have traveled have had similar experiences of really being broken by the poor. And that's not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. I think it's important to have our sort of comfort zone shattered. I think it's important, whether it's here in the U.S. or abroad, to kind of really try to see the actual struggles that people have. And you know, seeing that at a young age, I think, always gave me a certain sense of my own privilege and a certain feeling of responsibility to do something with that. <clears throat> yeah, because I'm losing my voice. I'm like Clinton. How can we help as individuals to move our country or other countries toward the belief first and the practice second that health care <laughs> is a human right? Yeah. Well, you know, I think there are a couple of things I would say. One is... You know, we don't need everybody to change the world, right? I mean, Margaret Mead has this amazing quote that never doubt that a small group of individuals can change the world. Indeed, that's all that ever has, right? No social movement ever won with a majority opinion. So I don't think it's that important to convince everyone that health care should be a right. I think it's important to have a social strategy, to have the right information, the right social strategy, and then press on the right levers of power and the right buttons. Because if we try to get everyone on the same page, we're going to fail. There are too many other interests. There are too many powers out there. There are too many people who just don't care, right? So I think the more important thing is to sort of work with your own community, your own people, your own professional organization on issues that will bring about a, a recognition of health care as, as a right. Um, and then I think what would the practice look like in this country? I think, I think you know, it would look like the public option, and, and we kind of let that die with very little fanfare, you know. So um, I think we need, to, we need to establish that. The other thing I would say with the chance you know, the health reform that's coming here is the use of community health workers, of, you know, visiting nurses. The people who are actually out in the communities have to be listened to, better compensated, thought of as a critical part of the system instead of just having stuff dumped on them because that's how we're going to get to the hot spotters, the people in Camden, the Navajo Nation. And so I think... Um, organizing around principles that have to do with healthcare access and sort of trying to figure out ways to speak up for a, a more community-based system of, of health care. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for the wonderful and very insightful talk. And thank you all for being here. And before you leave, uh, I just want to announce that next week's talk is by Dr. Greg Poland uh, from the Mayo Clinic. And the title of his talk is Vaccines in the 21st Century 
innumeracy, cognitive biases, the power of story, and other survival lessons. I hope that you'll all join us. Thank you again for coming.